Hi, I'm Patricia Allingham Carlson, and this is my video of Cataloosa Road. This is a multi-step project in which I use different progressions of drawing, masking, painting, adding dry pigment, and then more painting. So it's a little complicated, but I think it helped me to achieve some good textures and some good dimension in the painting. This is part one of two, because it took quite a while to get through the whole process. Cataloosa Road is in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and it passes through rolling hills, winding drives, bridges, a stream, an old mill and forests. The views there are wonderful every turn you go around. This painting is based on a photograph by a local photographer named Gregory Allen Keir. And I thank you, Greg, for letting me use the painting or the uh, photograph for my painting. I hope you enjoy it and give it a thumbs up. Now let's paint. I began with a pencil sketch. The photograph I was looking at was beautifully composed, laid out just perfectly by the photographer. So all I had to do was follow his format. Sketch in the road that went around a bend, the snowy hillsides on each side of the road, and the bridge down at the bottom of the road. And everything surrounded by towering trees that were partly covered from the recent snowfall. Getting the right curve in the road and the proper perspective seemed to take a while, but it's worth it if you need to get it right. After the sketch was laid out, I pulled out my masking fluid. This happens to be Peebo brand, which I find to be pretty adaptable for thick line or thin line using an ink pen application. For the thin lines, it takes a lot of patience because you have to dip repeatedly, clear your pen, over and over as the Peebo drives, dries, and just do an awful lot of patient small detailing. But it will give you the results that you want for thin lines. My ink pen was getting a little tedious. So now I'm using the end of a paintbrush and I'm dipping it repeatedly into the Peebo bottle and drawing the line out in that manner. When the ink pen clogs up, it seems that I continue to go back to the good old end of the paintbrush over and over again. And the cleanup is just easy as can be because you just pull it off after it's all dry. I'm putting down the masking fluid wherever I want to have strong highlights on the snow and on the trees, as well as on the road. So I'm planning ahead for this aspect. Now at this point the masking fluid has dried and I'm adding a first layer of paint. This is my shading color and then my sky color that will go behind all the trees. There were some lovely subtle colors on the snow. A little bit of pinks, a little bit of blues, even some purples. Because I plan to wash this whole surface over after it's dry and after I've used the powdered pigment on top of it. 
I'm making my colors a little brighter than I normally would. Because I'm suspecting that maybe they might wash off to some extent. I've never done a prepared painting and then applied powdered black pigment, washed it off, and gone back to paint some more. So this is an experiment for me, and I'm sort of excited about it. For a distant tree line, I bring the color right down to the horizon, and then I'm washing all across the sky behind the trees or the future trees. I want this to be somewhat wet, but not dripping wet with big pools and puddles. So I have to get it all spread out fairly evenly. The photograph I was looking at did not have such brilliant colors in the sky. But I knew two things. First, that watercolor fades when it dries. And second, that I plan to wash water over this whole paper, which might take some more paint off. So I'm making it sort of on the brilliant side here. I'm using yellow, I'm using vermilion, and I'm using some permanent pink. For the upper part of the sky, I used cobalt blue and indigo, as well as some Payne's gray. And right down along the base horizon line, I used mainly indigo and Payne's gray for the distant tree line. This is working wet on wet. To enhance and increase the brilliance of the color, I'm adding a little more vermilion and a little more permanent pink onto the sky and the road. And then I spray them lightly with some water spray to help them to blend out. And now into the top part of the painting, I'm enhancing my darks with a little bit of indigo and a little bit of Payne's gray. I'm using my hand as a block to block the water from going where I don't want it to go. And I'm wiping down the sides of the painting so the water doesn't seep under the tape and make a mess. Time for it to dry completely. And now comes the tricky part. I am putting down water everywhere I do not want the powdered paint to stick. Where the paper is dry, the paint powder will stick. And where it's wet, it will not stick and it will wash right off. What's tricky about this is that I have to do it fast because I have to wet down the whole paper the right way before I can put on the powdered paint and take it to the sink and wash the whole thing off. If it's dry, then it's going to end up sticking. And I don't want black snow, because I'm using black powdered paint. I want the snow to be very, very clean looking, except where there's some shadows, maybe. 
the top part of the sky should be very clean looking too. And only the trees should pick up on the paint powder. Now I've used masking on the trees, so that will resist anything. But I've got to paint water around the top where I don't want the paint to stick. Why go to so much trouble, you might ask? I think it's because the powdered paint adds such texture, and such dimension, and it's very exciting to work with that with paint after it's all dry. Sometimes it works out beautifully, and sometimes it doesn't work quite as well. So I guess I'm sort of taking a chance here, but it's an experiment. And I'm hoping it will give me a lot more than it takes away. I guess I'll see. Areas I wet earlier, I'm coming back and re-wetting for the snow where I do not want it to be dark and dirty. I'm hoping for the powder to stick onto the road and onto the trees. And not onto the sky where the colors should be clean, like the very top, because I can always paint a tree on top of that. A little random sprinkle here and there, and here comes the powdered paint. I shake it over the whole paper, concentrating on the areas that I want to be good and dark. It's on a spoon and I'm tapping the spoon off with my hand. So it sort of falls in a random matter. One tree is going all the way to the top. So I made sure I put one little line there. Now I carry it quickly into my sink. And then I'm going to be pouring water over the whole painting. The water will wash away the extra paint and leave a subtle texture where it sticks. And again, the places it will stick will be where the paper was totally dry. Now here I've poured the water. You can see the paper is very, very wet. And you could see quite a mess on the paper and on the tape. And I'll have to be cleaning some of that up a little bit. The way I'll do that is with a big fluffy brush, brushing over some of the areas where the paint stuck and I didn't want it to stick. That will sometimes remove it. Here it is dry or drying. I've laid it down on a table and I've put paper towels on top of it to blot. Now I'm not going to rub those paper towels back and forth because I just want them to gently soak up the extra water. And here is how it looks. Hmm. I think it looks pretty interesting. I'm going to let it dry and I'm going to start to paint because I'm excited about this one. This is a small eraser. I'm using it to erase some of the masking off. I'm also using it to erase some of the powdered paint off to the best of my ability, because it doesn't like to come off real easily. but I'm trying to clean up the whole paper.
The powdered paint that I happen to be using is Blick Powdered Tempera Paint. I'm not sure if that's even made by Blick anymore, but I do know that they have other powdered temper paint at their Blick site at Blick.com. Checking out colors, and then I begin to paint onto the road to start the kind of detailing that I want. Can you see how that powdered paint? has left some wonderful textures in there for me to work with. I'm not sure how well it shows up on the screen here, but it really does provide some exceptional starting capability and some extra dimension into the work. I'm forming the sides of the road. I'm forming the snow banks and how they climb up. how some of the snow has been pushed up into a pile on the side of the road. And it has gravels and rocks in it, so it's a bit dark and cluttered up. If you add the dimensional slopes, it starts to bring your painting into perspective, and it really helps instead of plain blank sides of the road. Adding some slope lines and some shadows really helps a lot. Now on the other side of the road, there's a ditch and then the slope. So it goes up and down. So I'm carefully forming out how the landscape rolls, how the hills and shadows and shades all come together to create this composition. And I'm glad I have such a great reference photo to look at. The trees in their beautiful vertical and diagonal forms add such structure to this painting. Now the sides of some of them are masked because they had snow stuck all along the side from the driving snows that had fallen. So since that masking's on there, I can paint them in and get their compositional lines without worrying about trying to paint around any white areas. There are a lot of trees in this painting, as well as on Cutaloosa Road itself. So I think the trees took more time than anything. And this is just the first one I'm detailing. Fortunately, I like trees. So I mostly had fun doing these. Something I learned about painting trees, they are not symmetrical, they are not regular. If you paint the tree so it's perfectly symmetrical, it's probably going to look like a design tree and not a real natural tree. And the, the branches themselves don't just all get slapped on like sticks, they have to follow their own format. They fork, they branch off, they twist, they turn. 
On some trees, the branches are very straight. On some trees, they're straight and curly, and so on it goes. As each tree goes upward and outward, the branches get thinner and thinner and thinner. So adding this kind of variety and overlap and shape diversity is what makes them look natural. Something else you might observe is that in a forest where trees are very closely spaced, they won't have a lot of branches down low because the branch's sole reason to exist is to support the leaves to catch the sunlight. Now down low, there's no sunlight because they're all crowded together. So in a closely crowded forest, you're gonna have all the branches at the top of the trees. In your backyard, you're gonna have branches coming out way down low because your yard doesn't have a forest in it. At least my yard doesn't. Now I'm sure you know this, but the trees in the foreground are obviously going to be taller for the most part than the trees in the far background. They will get smaller and smaller and smaller as they go back in space. Painting these trees, I'm using a mixture again of indigo, sepia, and a little bit of Payne's gray. In some of the trees, I'm including purple. I'm not using black paint for this, but I did use black powdered paint for that section where I added the dry pigment. If I didn't speed this video up, you would have been watching many, many, many hours of tree painting. But we did speed things up a little bit. We were filming our videos faster before, and we've slowed them down a bit at your request. What do you think of this speed? That would be really helpful to have your feedback if you could. Drop us a line in the comments section. Let us know if this is a good speed for you. Too slow, too fast, how we're doing. Thank you. As I continue to paint trees, I can throw a couple more ideas your way. My most intense and concentrated pigment I'm using right now will be for the foreground trees. As I go back into space and further away from the foreground, I'm adding a little bit more water with each bit of, of distance so the trees are not quite as intense in color. The reason I put that distant tree line in with just watercolor paint, as well as some of the dry powdered paint is because I won't detail any trees at all, all the way back in the distance. I will let the haze of color imply that they are there. If you have a good water brush, watercolor brush, 
one of the greatest ways to paint trees is using that push down a little harder on the brush to the paper for the thick lines. And as you get outward toward the thinnest branches, pull your brush up so the tip is barely touching the paper. So with a good brush, you should be able to get thick lines, raise it a little bit, medium lines, and raise it so that just the tip is touching and get very fine lines. without changing brushes. And that's what I'm doing with these trees here. Really enjoying my, I believe it's Daniel Smith sable brushes, which were a gift from my husband for one Christmas. And they work very well for this particular function. As you can see, I have a whole empty slope on the left side of the paper. I started working on the right, going from foreground to middle ground to background. I don't know if that was the right way to work or not, but it happens to be what I did. Being a left-handed person, I try to work from right to left, so I'm less likely to run into some wet paint and smear it. But now I'm approaching this big slope on the left side of the paper. There were a number of small trees growing from it. And the slope goes down to the stream. And the stream runs under the bridge, which is down at the end of the road. But that's going to be another story, because I have a lot more detailing to do. Did you ever notice the trees growing on a slope? have a diagonal trunk so that the longer end of the diagonal is pointing down the slope and as you go up the slope it angles inward. Take a look at a photograph sometime so you can see what I mean. But that's how I'm painting the trees that are clearly established and growing from the slope. I have the colors down, the trees are growing, and the masking is still on. Oh boy, this is going to take a lot of work, but I'm sure having fun. Hope to see you for part two. We slowed down the speed of this video at your request. Can you drop us a line in the comments? Let us know how this is working for you. We're trying to help you to understand what I'm trying to show you with my painting. And if it was too fast to comprehend, that wasn't going to work. And if it was too slow, well, then that just takes forever. Your feedback would really help. I hope you enjoyed my video. Part one of Cutaloosa Road. It'd be awesome if you'd give us a thumbs up. And ring the bell in the links below so you won't miss any future videos if you subscribe. There's some more links below too. My Facebook art page, my blog, products I like to use, and art products I make. Thanks for watching. See you next video.